Cody. How you doing, sir? Good to see you, buddy. I saw, I went to Mark, Mark had a, I think I was going to have Cap have a little camp meeting, and I, Betty Gold was there. And what now? Betty Gold was there. Oh, really? Oh, they have. Yeah, they're her permit. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're her permit. Our daughter, yes. Yes, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I was, I was, I was excited. To, good people. To, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I started the Facebook just a couple minutes early uh, so that we can get settle down here and uh, get ready to go. I, I can't turn the volume down, so for those of you who may be logged on, uh, you, just, you just have to listen to the noise. Thank you, buddy. Got so much noise <laughs> right now. I just, just want to make sure you could. What's that? Yeah, I, I know it is. about three more minutes for those of you on Facebook. Thanks for logging on. I see Donna, Donna, Eddie Gallo. I don't want to touch anything there. You might lose it. <laughs> Two and a half minutes, folks. Two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Marshall, in one minute, you get the whip out. Crack the whip. <laughs> Yeah, 
I'm just teasing now. I said I tried to get the Budweiser to sign out of the right hand corner, but it wouldn't go out. Okay, folks, the Word of God is alive and powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and marrow, and is critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to open the word of truth this morning to the concept of the baptism of fire. Now, the baptism of fire is not going to help you in any way in your everyday life if you have problems. But what it will do is to give you a perspective on where we are in human history and what's going to happen seven, seven years after you and I are raptured. Now, in thinking about that, there, there's so much going on in our country today. And by the way, I suppose you saw that the, um, uh, let's see, the, 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 Valley, the Valley Bank in California. Yeah. Is, uh, is in deep, deep trouble. Matter of fact, the people are lining up in front, of the, in front of the bank right now to draw out their money, which is going to cause tremendous problems. They're not even, they're not even sure right now that on tomorrow morning whether they're either going to open up the market or not. It's just that bad. And what I want you to understand is just how bad it is, and I know that probably most of you, if not all of you, already know, but the thought, that came, the thought that came to my mind was this. If I can get it all together by, by Wednesday evening, and by the way, I will be teaching on Wednesday night, Daryl and Nita accept the fact that there is another snowstorm on its way in North Dakota. And I told them, I told Daryl yesterday, that uh, I, would, uh, I wanted him, I, I was teasing, said I don't want him to go back to the Philippines because I like the fact that he's doing the Wednesday night for me at this point in time. <laughs> so I told him, I said I was going to pray because he he'd had plans to leave on Tuesday. I said I was going to pray that it would snow some more <laughs> and that he would, he would not be able to go. Only to find out that there is a snowstorm on the way. <laughs> so... Really, I am I am scheduled to teach the next few Wednesdays again until he gets back in the Philippines. But the question is whether or not he'll be able to get back, uh, whether he'll be able to leave on Tuesday or not. And if not, he he probably will take the take the, uh, the teaching session anyway. And uh, we'll pray for him to get back there. They've got a great camp coming up, and uh, if uh, it's going to cost about three thousand dollars for the campers to be there, it'd be a little over a hundred people, the kids and everything, the, the counselors. So if in any way you want to contribute to that, you're welcome to do that. And the way you would do that is just uh, uh, write a check to the uh, Christian Way of Life Church 
and I deposit in his bank right across the street from my bank here in Maumelle. Makes it very easy to transfer that money. But uh, just as God leads you, if you decide to do something about that. Now, uh, another thought that I have on my mind, in all that's going on in our country today and around the world, um, Troy asked me if I... Yes? Okay, somebody's got their mount microphone yes. on. Your microphone is not on. Uh, is it coming? Is it coming through my um, my iPad? Yeah, let me see. Something something going on here. Just, I've got I've got your I've got your iPad to Facebook. Yes, that's right. Well, that's working. But hang on, let me see something here. Okay. Um, now I got it. Now, now you're on. Okay, that's fine. So anyway, here's here's the issue. As bad as it is, the thought that comes to my mind is this. That until you and I, or any other Christian, is able to view the circumstances of life objectively. And what I want to do is draw a picture of two heads. The head of two Christians, one is thinking objectively, and the other is thinking subjectively. So I don't care how much doctrine you have, until you start to think objectively, you're going to be in the middle of that rat race. You're going to be upset. You're going to be disturbed. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be worried, because you're not really applying the doctrine that you know, and that is God's got your back. And when you understand that, you will be able to relax no matter how bad it becomes. And it's, there's untold number of kids out here and people out here who need Jesus Christ as their Savior. And when they see you falling apart, when, you, when you, they see you listening to the news and accepting the host comments, Oh... I'm worried about this. I'm scared about this. I'm whatever. You are just as bad as they are. Now, I hate to say it that way, but it's, it's that critical. So you need to think objectively so that you see the situation and all you're doing is evaluating when you see how bad it is, you're not going to say, oh, how bad it is. You know it's bad. And what you're going to do is relax and be happy and rejoice in the midst of that because you know God's got your back. So it's an objective, uh, uh, an objective attitude as opposed to a subjective attitude. And the tragedy today is thousands and thousands of people who have doctrine are thinking subjectively and don't have the control of their own life and are just as bad as the guy next door. I don't want you to be there. So with that in mind, let me uh, take just a moment of time to, uh, to pray, and we'll get into our study on the baptism of fire. And all this is going to do is give you a perspective of where this thing is headed. And by the way, I don't think I have this in my notes, but the baptism of fire is as close as one second plus seven, day, seven years. The baptism of fire is as close as one second plus and seven years. So with that in mind, the rapture may occur before we get out of here. And when it does, it's countdown. So with your head bowed and eyes closed, you prepare yourself for the study of God's word through the re technique of rebound and operation cry. I will close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we left off. Father, as a, as a pastor, my heart is filled with love for people. <clears throat> it's filled with love for those people that are online with me, Facebook, Facebook uh, Zoom meeting, sitting here in this room. But Father, there's even more than that. Agape love embraces everybody. But the people that are online with me, Facebook, Zoom, in this room, I have a love that is phileo love. 
for these people. Father, there's a bond between all of us that is just amazing. And as, as a pastor, and if I can say it this way, as the pastor of those people who are online and in this room, I want to be a model. I want to be the, uh, I want to be the person that they look to and say, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. And I'm praying, Father, that our folks will continue to live in the same manner that they are <clears throat> as long as they are functioning in the sphere of the Spirit and manifesting the life of the humanity of Christ. When I look at, when I look at them like this, as the Apostle Paul said, they are my reward. They are my crown. And I just praise you for it in Christ's name. So take this information this morning. Sanctify it to the nourishment of our soul. We'll add this doctrine to the doctrines already there. So that we will be able to communicate this information to the thousands of people out here. Millions of people who actually need it. You'll put them in our path. And when they come into our path, listen, I'll just pray, pray, Father, that you'll give us the opportunity, open the door, that we can communicate the truth to them and point out their, their need for Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay. I need to get my a new, a new page. here right. okay here we go the baptism of fire the question is this what is the baptism of fire the baptism of fire is defined in this way it's defined as a judgment that's the righteousness and the justice of God looking at a certain situation it will be the lives of certain people namely unbelievers and this is the righteousness and justice of God dealing with unbelievers at a period of time yet future so here's the issue this is why when you study cell junior Uai, sovereignty eternal life love justice absolute righteousness so that the integrity of God is the righteousness plus the justice plus agape love looking at a situation. And the righteousness of God looks at the situation and says of that person's life, oh, they're positive toward the word of God. The justice of God immediately blesses. But if the righteousness of God looks at that individual and through the omniscience of God sees negative volition, the justice of God goes into action and the consequence is divine discipline in the life of that person. So this is a judgment. The baptism of fire is a judgment of living unbelievers in the tribulation. Now you see, if you just read this information, you say, oh, well, I'm not quite sure what he's talking about here because he's talking about uh, unbelievers in the tribulation. Listen. By the time the baptism of fire gets there, there may be thousands or millions of unbelievers that are already dead that die in the tribulation. We're not talking about the dead unbelievers. We're talking about the living unbelievers at the second coming of Christ. So the baptism of fire is defined as the judgment of living unbelievers because there will be believers and unbelievers in the tribulation. There will be living and dead believers and unbelievers. But we're talking here about unbelievers living at the time of the second advent. The second coming of Christ. Now remember, by that time, you're already, you've already been out of here for seven years. And guess what? You're coming back with him at this time. So they, they are removed. Unbelievers are removed from the earth and placed in in hellfire in the fire of hell for 1,000 years until the last judgment which is a great white throne judgment at which time they will be resurrected to go to that judgment so stop and think with me again the baptism of fire is defined as the judgment of living unbelievers in the tribulation at the second advent they are removed from the earth and placed in hellfire 
the fire of hell for 1,000 years until the last judgment, and that'll be at the end of the millennium. That 1,000 years is the entire period of the millennium. They are in hell waiting for a resurrection body. Now look at, the, look at the timeline that I have here. I've drawn this little diagram to show you the, the various dispensations, and I've numbered each one of them, and each number is going to have some information that you need to be able to understand. This is probably going to be review for most, but let's look at it. First of all, there are four, di there are four dispensations or four ages here. The first one is the age of the Gentiles. That was the first that was the first age in human history. Then we had the age of Israel. Then we have the age of grace, which is what we're in now. And sometimes while I, while I end, uh, it really realize that we should not be using the word church because there are three churches, church in the wilderness, Christ church, and then the body of Christ. But so many people today, even while they may confuse the body of Christ with the church in the wilderness, living out of the Old Testament, or the, or the uh, Christ church, which is his, his disciples, you could see that at the, on the day of Pentecost. I still like to use the word church in this sense, and then say the body of Christ, because there may be people with us who don't completely understand, then I have an opportunity to explain that the word church is not what we should be using today. It's the body of Christ, and that's us assembled here and wherever other, body, uh, wherever, wherever other believers are assembled. So here's the issue. The baptism of fire is defined as the judgment of living unbelievers at, in the tribulation at the second advent and they're removed and placed in hell for a thousand years now there are your four dispensations gentiles israel grace tribulation which is the last seven years of the age of israel and then we have the thousand years of millennium let's take a look at the numbers and what those numbers should be telling us right now this is information that i believe you and i both need to know so we can help people to understand what the christian way of life is all about number one the age of the Gentiles begins. Secondly, number two, the age of Israel begins and the age of the Gentiles ends. Number three, on the line, the age of grace. We called that in the past the church age. The age of grace begins and the age of Israel is interrupted. It doesn't end. But the age of Israel is interrupted. Then number four, the age of grace ends, the rapture occurs at that same time, the age of Israel resumes as the tribulation period of seven years, and number five is the seven-year tribulation ends and, the, and ends the age of Israel. See, we have the age of Israel back between the Gentiles and grace. We've got the last seven years between four and five, so five is the seven-year tribulation ends, the period or the age of Israel. The second advent occurs at that same time, and we begin the 1,000 years of the millennium. Number six is the great white throne judgment. The 1,000-year millennium ends, and eternity future begins. So we need to understand that, that timeline to understand how human history is is unfolding now i have some sub sub notes here that are things that i believe that we need to understand at the second coming of christ and by the way you need to realize you need to realize that there are some who are actually going to believe that the second coming is the rapture because they don't understand that the rapture is separate apart from the second coming. And so when the, when, the, uh, when the rapture occurs, hey, that's the second coming. No, it's not. They're two separate events. And they're seven years apart. So Christ is coming back in the air for the rapture where he's going to take the body of Christ, that's you and me, out of the graves and those that are alive up in the air and take us to the third heaven. And we will be going through the... Uh, the Bema Seat Judgment, while the tribulation is unfolding at that point in time. 
So in sub point number one, at the second coming of Christ, and if you wanted to look, and I don't need to, but if you went back to your timeline, you'd see where the second coming is on the timeline at the end of the rapture. And at that point in time, all unbelievers in the tribulation will be, that's the living ones, will be removed from the earth and identified with hellfire. See, the, those that die in unbelief in the tribulation is in any period, period of time, immediately the unbelievers go to hell. That's where they are, awaiting the resurrection at the end of human history, at the end of the millennium, to be resurrected to go to the great white throne judgment. So at the second coming of Christ, all unbelievers in the tribulation who are alive will be removed from the earth and identified with fire. That is the baptism of fire. See, baptism means identified. So in seven baptisms, you're going to be identified with something. There's ritual, and there is, there is a, a water baptism, baptisms that relate themselves to water. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Now notice the two passages of Scripture, Matthew 3, 11b, and 11b, that when you see the b or an a or something like that, a means the first part of the verse, b means the last part of the verse. So what we find then is in Matthew 3, 11b, the last half of that verse, you see the baptism of fire mentioned. And here's what it says. It says, he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, what happens here is we see then there are two baptisms here. One is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and the other is the baptism of fire. And while there are seven baptisms mentioned in the Bible, there are two of them mentioned here. One is the baptism of the, with the Holy Spirit, and then there's the baptism with fire. In Luke 3.16, the last half of that verse, he, Jesus, will baptize you. Now notice Jesus is the one who's doing the baptizing. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So there we have the baptism of fire, and that occurs at the second coming of Christ. Second sub-point here is the baptism of fire occurs at the time of the second coming of Christ. We're being specific, and by the way, in dealing with this, there's going to be a lot of, uh, lot of repetition. Uh, you can say, oh, you said that 17 times. I'm going to say it 17 times. So to understand the point that's being made. There is a baptism of fire, but it will occur at the second of advent. Not, not at the, uh, the rapture, no other time, second advent. Now at the second advent, number five again, points to the timeline. Unbelievers who are still alive will be identified with the fire in hell. That means they will be cast into hell. They're, they're going to be taken off of the planet, off of planet Earth, and, and cast sent into hell, and that's in, the, that's in the belly of the earth. And I've indicated, I've indicated to you in the, in the past, but I'll repeat it here. The, the idea of people being placed in hell, could God really do, uh, in, in fire, could God really do that? Yes, he could. But I'm, I'm concerned about whether or not there is literal, a, a literal fire there, and I know that I, as soon as I say there isn't, it's going to cause an uprising from thousands and millions of other people. But let me ask you this. Which do you think is the worst of the two? To be, to be, to be in a literal fire, flames of fire, or separated from God for eternity? Which do you think would be the? Now I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to turn my head. Okay, I, I know. I know what you're. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the same thing I am. So if I if I find out later on that there is no fire in hell, and what he's trying to tell you and describe for you just how horrible this is going to be. No, I don't want to be in a fire. No, you take a look at some of these people that have been burned in fires. And when I, was, when I was in the Navy as a hospital corpsman in Pensacola, Florida, where they trained our naval cadets, you, can't, you don't know how many times I, I, I worked with and worked on those young men who had had a crash out there and came in and were burned in those airplanes before they got them out and brought them into the hospital. And when you, when you got them, when you were ministering to them, working with them medically, 
and you had to give them inoculation, you had to take scissors or pound through the burnt skin to cut the people, uh, to cut the, the skin out, the burnt skin, to give them an inoculation. I've been there, I understand that. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know of anything more horrible than to be separated from God for eternity. So I'll go with a hellfire, but I won't be disappointed later on if I find out it wasn't there. It's just separation from God for an eternity. Without a chance of recovery, you always say. What's that? Without a chance of recovery. Amen. Point number four. <clears throat> Unbelievers disciplined by the baptism of fire. See, the baptism of fire is discipline. But I don't know how, worse it, how much worse it could get to know, again, that when you're separated from God at that point in time, it's going to be actually for an eternity. So they're spending a thousand years in hell waiting for the resurrection, hoping maybe that their, their good deeds... Remember, when at, the, at the great white throne, the books will be open, and it's the books of deeds, good deeds, and you're, you're, you're just believing the hope. You're in, if you're in hell... And you're waiting for that time. He says, well, I, I, I just, I wish I'd have done that other thing that was good, but uh, maybe I've got enough here that will balance the scales between my good and Jesus' death on the cross, only to find out it's too late, folks. It's too late. So this, in, uh, in point, number, point number four, unbelievers disciplined by the baptism of fire will spend 1,000 years in hell that is, that is the entire period of millennium from the beginning to the end of the millennium. In sub point five, all believers from every age will be resurrected at the end of the millennium. All unbelievers will be, from every age, Gentiles, Israel, age of grace, tribulation, all unbelievers from every age will be resurrected at the end of the millennium. That's number six on the timeline, and will be judged at the great white throne, that's number six, and what are they going to do? They will be found guilty, because all of their human good will not outbalance or bring into balance with the, with the work of Christ on Calvary's cross. And that's why if you're with me today, in here, online, Zoom, you're on Facebook, you're going to come to the um, uh, to to YouTube later on, and you hear me, if you're not saved now, you if you do not know that you're saved, it is time for you to understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, paid for every one of them, past, present, and future. He was buried, and three days later he came out of the grave. And if there is no resurrection, there is no hope for you in the future anyway. Therefore, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You're believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now, in point, uh, in point number two, uh, at the end of point number five there, they'll be found guilty and will be sentenced to eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. So they're in hellfire for a thousand years and will spend eternity in the lake of fire, which is an entirely different location than hellfire. In point number two, we're, con we're talking about the baptism of fire. Both Jewish believers and Gentile believers who are alive at the end of the tribulation will be involved in the second advent judgment. So you just have to be, you have to be an unbeliever during that period of time. And while you are in the age of Israel, there will be Gentiles in that period of time because you see the Gentiles at the rapture of the church and are alive go right into the tribulation. So if they don't get saved by the time that by the time the second advent gets there. They will, they will be cast into hellfire also because they are unbelievers. So both Jewish unbelievers and Gentile unbelievers who are alive at the end of the tribulation will be involved in the second advent judgment, which is the baptism of fire. Now what I've done is I've got another diagram here, and I only went back, started on the left-hand side with the age of grace, which is what, where we are now, and then with that, that, uh, that vertical line, is the division between the age of grace and the tribulation. That's where the rapture of the church occurs. And you have the seven years of tribulation. Then I've got another vertical line at the beginning of the millennium. 
But I have, I have in the tribulation period, I've got a, a, got a box there that says unbelievers, Jews and Gentiles. Now we're only dealing with them. There will be believers during that period of time. We're not talking about the believers in the tribulation. We're talking only about unbelievers. So there will be Jewish unbelievers and there will be Gentile unbelievers. And at the second advent, the baptism of fire takes place and what happens? God removes all of the unbelievers, Jew and Gentile, and sends them to hell. Now, if you'll stop and think with me, you understand that during that seven-year tribulation, there will be people who are alive. And there will be people who have already died. Jews and Gentiles already died. Some of the Gentiles will be martyrs. Some of the Jews will just die of old age or whatever else that it causes their death. But at, during the tribulation, there will be both living and dead Gentiles and Jews. And what we want to see is at the end of the millennium, at the end of the tribulation, at the second advent, you're going to divide up those people in the tribulation, saved and unsaved. And the saved don't go to hell. They don't suffer the baptism of fire. They're blessed and go into the millennium. We'll talk about that in a minute. But focusing only on the dead, on the, I'm sorry, the, the live unbelievers, they're all sent to hell at that point in time. Now, you know that if there are those that are alive during the time of the tribulation, at the second advent, they're not just going to stay in the tribulation. They've got to go somewhere, and God has a plan for them where he's going to take them. But what we need to realize is that the unbelievers are cast into hellfire by way of the what baptism? The baptism of fire. They are identified with fire, and it's the fire of hell. So I've got the second advent, the baptism of fire. Mark got an arrow there at the end of the, at the, end of the tribulation, and those in that box... The unbelievers, Jews and Gentiles, will be cast into hell at that point in time. Sub point three, major point three. The baptism of fire results in the millennium beginning with believers only. Now stop and think. See, you already you see you've already seen that. If there are living if there are living people in the tribulation of the second advent, some believers and some are unbelievers and the unbelievers are cast into hellfire, who's left? Believers. believers. So the question is, if the I guess if the, uh, if the tribulation ends, where are they going to go? See, God has a plan for them, and you can see on the, on the line, on that second line under, under number three there, that the believers go into the millennium, and the unbelievers go into hell. Second Advent... Baptism of fire. So we've seen now what happens to the believers and unbelievers at the time of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation. Now we've got a couple passages of scripture here. Again, we want to go back and look at them. We we took a look at Matthew three eleven b, but what I want to do is read verse eleven and twelve, and let's talk about this and see where it's teaching this concept of the baptism of fire. Here's what it says. As for me, John the Baptist is speaking. And by the way, let me say this. John was not a Baptist. Okay? John was not a Baptist. John was a baptizer. He was involved in baptizing. So he's, we refer to as John the Baptist, but again, I, I, when I say he's not a Baptist, I say that humorously, okay? For people out here who think, oh, he must have been a Baptist. No, that's okay. Okay. Um, Lots of Baptists out here, but John was not a Baptist. He was a baptizer. So it says, as for me, John speaking, he said, I baptize you, I identify you. Now, who's he talking to here? What he was talking to was a group of Pharisees and Sadducees who were Jews, and they had heard about him, and they were coming out to, they were coming out to him where he was doing the baptizing, and they were coming out to to receive the baptism of repentance. They were repenting of their, of their sins. And it, repentance really means to change your mind. They changed their mind about this Jesus. 
So they were coming to be baptized to identify with him at that, at that time. So John says, I baptize you, Pharisees and Sadducees, coming for John's baptism. And you need to realize now, if they're, when you're talking about Jews, and you need, to get, you need to give some consideration to this also. A true Jew is a Jew who has the a person who has the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they are born again. They receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, this is back in the Old Testament. It's during the age of Israel when a Jew became saved. They were a messianic, called a messianic Jew. They had received Jesus as their Messiah. When John baptized these people, these were Jews who had become born again in the sense that they had believed that Jesus was their Messiah. So they're coming out to receive the baptism from John, who's doing the baptism, baptizing before Jesus comes on the scene. So he's baptizing these Jews who are now Messianic Jews. These are not Christians. These are Messianic Jews. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus was a Jew. He had the genes of Abraham, uh, had the genes of Abraham, but he was not a true Jew because he was not born again. But when he met Jesus on the road and became a believer, he became a Messianic Jew. He did not become a Christian. And he wasn't a Christian until he went into the desert. Somewhere along that line, he became a, the first born-again Christian, and he was given the message for you and I to follow. And that's why Daryl mentioned this last, uh, last, uh, uh, last Wednesday, that when you look at the Bible, what did he say, 90, 90 92% of the Bible has nothing to do with us? It's the, it's, the, it's the information that God, that God gave Paul to live the Christian way of life. Now, are we casting out, are we throwing out the rest of the Bible? No, there are illustrations there. There are things back there where you see how God works with human beings. There's value in that, but that's not where we get the rules for living. Okay? Just take this popped up here. Janet, you've got your camera on. Janet, turn your camera off. Turn your camera off. Down on the bottom of the page, you've got your camera on. Lynn, go in and show her how to turn her camera off. That'll be fine. It just popped up here when you came on this when you came on the screen. So let's come back here. Um, we're looking at Matthew three eleven. That's good. Okay, it's, it's still on, Janet. That's okay. Here's what he says, and for me, I baptize you, how? I baptize you with water. This is a ritual baptism. There is a real baptism and a ritual baptism. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is a, this is a, 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 a ritual baptism that requires water. So he said, I baptize you with water for repentance because you have repented. You, are, as a Jew, have changed your mind about this Jesus. And he goes on and says, but he, Leanne, turned the camera off down at the bottom of the page. Down at the bottom of the page. And just touched the camera. No. Do this. Just turn. Just turn your phone toward the wall. Turn the phone toward the wall. That's good. Okay. Okay. Moving on. But then it says, "I'm baptizing you for repentance because you repented." But He, Jesus, is coming after me which means as in a line of succession. In God's plan, John the Baptist was to come first, then Jesus is going to come on the scene as far as his ministry is concerned. So he said that he was coming after me is mightier than I. I mean, I'm baptizing you with water and baptism for repentance, but man, there's one, there's one coming after me that's mightier than I. I can't take your sins away. But I'll tell you what he's going to He's mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. 
And by that, at that point in time, one of the one of the lowest jobs in the world was to remove somebody's shoes from their feet. And he says, I'm not, he said, I, I, as a lowly servant of Christ, if I were serving him, I'm not even, he said, I'm not even worthy of, of taking these sandals off. I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He said, he though, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now what you need to realize is this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and baptism with the Spirit, this is one of the most misunderstood baptisms that there is. This is not this is not to become a Christian. On the day of Pentecost, this baptism with the Holy Spirit was a supernatural thing, where they, or it was a a um, it was a a granting of power to speak in tongues, heal the sick, and heal the lame, etc. You don't have this. He's not given that to us. So he's talking to these Jews before the age of before the age of grace comes along. He's going to give them another option to get this thing right. About a forty-year option. They're going to blow it again. And by seventy by seventy A.D., we got a full-blown age of grace, functioning with the no no longer a transition period. We're into the real deal. Okay. So he says here, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and that's, he was going to do that. But that was, that was during the age of Israel. But now what's going to happen here, he's going to baptize them, Jews and Gentiles also. But he's going to baptize you with fire, and that's at the end of the tribulation. So there's a long period of time between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. But Jesus is going to do the baptizing. He baptized with the Holy Spirit, and he's going to baptize with fire. He's the baptizer. Then in verse 12, it says his winnowing fork is in his hands. What does that mean, a winnowing fork? Well, what that amounts to is if, you have, if you've got your grain on the floor, and you're trying to get the weeds out of it, how are you going to do it? Well, they had this, this, this fork-like thing, and you stir it around on the on the on the floor and you separate the wheat from the chaff the wheat from the weeds the wheat from the tares and then you're going to do one thing with the wheat and you're going to do something else with the tares with the weeds etc so he said his winnowing fork because he's talking about the baptism of fire now he said he will baptize you with the holy spirit and with fire now what he goes he extends this idea of the fire he said his winnowing fork is a grain shovel constructed to separate wheat from the chaff, and it's in Jesus' hands. And what's he going to do? He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. Now, by analogy, guess what? The threshing floor is the tribulation. It's a period of time, and he's going to clear the threshing floor. So as you would separate the wheat from the chaff, you burn the chaff, uh-huh, and you would keep the you would keep the grain to do something with it. You'd store it someplace else. So what he's going to do here, he's going to thoroughly, thoroughly. That means there's not going to be any mistakes. It's going to be perfect. He will thoroughly clean his threshing floor, which is the act of separating unbelievers from among the believers, who will go into the millennium in physical bodies. The believers will go into the millennium in physical bodies, but he's going to take out the unbelievers, separate them, and then it says, goes on and said he will gather his wheat. So once he has separated the wheat and the chaff, what he's going to do is gather his wheat, and the wheat is the Jew and Gentile believer in the tribulation, and he's going to take them into the barn, which is the millennial kingdom. But he, Jesus... Again, the baptizer, he will burn the chaff, and that's the unbelieving Jews and Gentiles at the second advent with unquenchable fire, which means he's going to cast them into hellfire as a part of the baptism of fire. Now, let's take a look at some, some subpoints here. What about this verse? Jews saved in the age of Israel are Messianic Jews. Jews saved at that time, Gentiles saved at that time, are proselytes. Secondly, Jews and Gentiles saved in the age of grace 
are Christians. Follow that? Jews saved in the tribulation, the last seven years of the age of Israel, are Messianic Jews and Gentiles are proselytes. Look at Luke 3, 16, the entire, the entire verse. John the Baptist responded to them all. That's the crowd of people who had repented to come to John for water baptism. He's responding to them all, saying, as for, as for me, John the Baptist, as for me, I baptize you of water. But he, Jesus, is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the straps of his sandals. Remarkable humility again. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost 30 AD. There, there are other times when it happened, but uh, so that we get an idea of what it is. At Pentecost 30 AD, and with fire at the second advent. Now, what we need to understand, and just re let's, let's review what we already know about baptisms. There are seven baptisms in the Bible. They're divided in two categories. There are real baptisms and there are ritual baptisms. Now what you need to do, understand about these seven baptisms is when you have a real baptism, there is no water. There's no water in this baptism. Four of them. In ritual baptism, that's the term we use, there are wet baptisms because water is involved. So let's look at the three. The, let's look at the four ritual baptisms. Real uh, look, four real baptisms minus water. It was the bapt baptism of Moses. This is the Jews coming out of out of Egypt. They get to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is behind them. They're blocked because of the sea. God opens up the God opens up the Red Sea. They go across on dry land. He closes the sea and drowns the, uh, drowns the people of uh, Pharaoh's army. There was water in the Red Sea, but there was no water in this baptism as far as the Jews were concerned. Then we have the baptism of the cross, identifying yourself with Christ on the cross. Then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then there is the baptism of fire. Four non-water baptisms. Then there is the ritual baptism which is water, water involved, the baptism of John the Baptist, baptizing these Jews for repentance at that time, the Messianic Jews, they become believers. Then there was the baptism of Jesus, and then the baptism of Christians. And now what we need to realize today again, in this sense, water baptism is not essential for born-again Christians. It's not essential. I was baptized in water, I was baptized in water because I told I had to be. But when you come to understand the scripture, you realize that it's not essential. But what happens is if you if you decided and were led by the Holy Spirit to go into a church where they required water baptism, I rather imagine there may be some people in this room right now, I know there's some online that have been baptized at least twice because you were baptized outside the Baptist church. But to get into the Baptist church, you had to be baptized. So if you're going to be a part of that, you had to be baptized a second time. Now that's fine. That's expedient. That's what's called the law of expediency. God's leading you to do this, leading you into that, in that assembly for whatever reason, whatever purpose. So you have to follow the guidelines. It's not sinful. So you do expediently, you get the water baptism again. Oftentimes people who are sprinkled when they were babies have to be water baptized later on because the, because the, the assembly requires it. Well, what we need to realize is it's not required today. So, let's move on. And that's one of the reasons why I haven't baptized since since we uh, uh, really since far back maybe as the, the, the Bible Doctrine Church of Little Rock. Point number five, the time of the baptism of fire is at the second advent again, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. Let's look at this. It says, for after all, this is good, for after all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Did you see that? Did you see that? 
Please listen to that. You're being afflicted today. And I will guarantee you, if we are alive long enough, we're going to be afflicted again. It may have, some, it may have everything to do with your money. Got your money in a bank? What about the what about the digital the digital coins? The digital the the, the the digitizing of your funds. Your money will be worth nothing, and the government will tell you, "Let's see, you're worth some uh, some uh, so much a month or so much a week. You'll give you that." That's just one thing. Christians being persecuted because of uh, they didn't wear masks in church. How about this? The military guys, the military guys thrown out of the military. Good grief! China and Russia, yeah. Iran ramping ramp him up. And we're throwing men out of the military. Oh, that's, that's smart, isn't it? Well, just stop and think about it. This is one of the reasons why I said I don't want these two heads. To make sure you understand that you're thinking, sub you're thinking objectively and not subjectively. Because the truth of the matter is, when you take a look and see all that's going on, are you rejoicing in all things? That's what God wants from us. We're able to do that. If you're applying doctrine. Okay? So here it is. For, for after all... It is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Now, what, what's that mean? Paul's talking to the Thessalonians. He's talking to believers and unbelievers who are antagonistic to doctrine. So when he was talking to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians, when he Second Thessalonians, when he was talking to them, he knew that these people were being persecuted by two different groups of people. They were persecuted by believers within the body of Christ. And how, how, how easy is that? When you tell somebody, you, when you try to help them to realize that tithing is not, is not spiritual giving. When you tell them that tongues is not, is not valid today. When you tell them that you don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to be baptized to join the church. As far as the scripture is concerned. Talking about things like that. There's your affliction. By believers and unbelievers. Being pressure. pressure putting pressure on believers. Along with us. So he says. And to give, to give relief to you. And to give relief. And uh, who are afflicted. He said along with us. So you're being afflicted. And Paul's also being afflicted. He said, when the Lord, now watch this. He said, you will, you, you're going to get relief. He says, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven. And that's the second advent. So I look at today, when we, we as Christians are looking at all that's going on. And if you're standing on the right side of history and watching the right kind of news and keeping up with the news and understanding what's going on, you and I are saying, I rather imagine, we want justice. We want justice. So when you look at the, when you look at the, uh, at Congress, you look at the House, you look at the Senate, you look at the FBI, you look at the, uh, um, the IRS, you look at these other departments, and you know what's gone on. You know what took place in 2016. You knew what took place in 2020. And you say, I want justice. I want, you're going to get it. You're going to get it, but it may not be in your lifetime. See, you're being afflicted today. I'm being afflicted. We are being afflicted. But see, you gotta, we have to operate on God's time schedule, not on ours. So the justice may not come until after we're out of here. Could come before that. You say, praise God. Well, what happens if it doesn't? See, you rejoice. You're happy in all that's going on. 
Because God is in control. And here's what he says. He said, and give relief to you who are afflicted along with us when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven. That's the second advent, not the rapture. With his mighty angels, and how's he coming? In flaming fire. Hmm. A reference to the baptism of fire, the second advent. What's he going to do? Dealing out retribution. Do you hear that? Steve, do you hear that? Danny, do you hear that? Dealing out retribution. It's payday for these people who have afflicted the church, who have afflicted the body of Christ. In flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. You know who those are? Those are unbelievers. Who was it that was, who was, it that was antagonizing the, the Thessalonians? It was unbelievers. But there were also believers. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel. Those are unbelievers. And to those, now watch, it says that to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said these people, these unbelievers, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. They're going to pay the penalty. What's the penalty? It's because they've antagonized you. They've antagonized believers. They're not on the same page. They're in the devil's world. This is the angelic conflict. You can expect this kind of thing. And expect it specifically if you're living the Christian way of life. Hmm. Will pay the penalty for eternal destruction, eternal condemnation, away from the presence of the Lord. When you're in the lake of fire, brother, you are away from, from God. And you're away from the glory of his power. Now there's a principle here. The baptism of fire is, down, is the down payment. Listen to this, please. Get this, get this in your mind. S some are going to hell, baptism of fire, then they're going to be resurrected a thousand years later, and go to the lake of fire. So really what it amounts to is being sent to hell is like being sent to the county jail. The great white throne judgment is being sent to the lake of fire, and that's like being sent to the federal penitentiary. So what happens is the baptism of fire is simply the down payment on what you're really going to get, which is the great white throne judgment and cast in the lake of fire. So when they go into hell, it's like going into the county jail as opposed to the federal penitentiary. When you get in a federal pen, you're not getting out. Some do, but this is just our <laughs> illustration here. In point number six, talking about the baptism of fire. Oh, yes, okay. The announcement of the baptism of fire was given by John the Baptist. He's the first one to do this. Matthew 3.11 and Luke, uh, Luke 3, 16 and 17 again. Let's just read them quickly. We've talked about this. The idea is that John the Baptist is the one who's announcing it. Matthew 3, 11, As for me, I, John, I make, I'm going to make an announcement. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he is, who is coming after me, which is Jesus, is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. Here's the announcement. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John's telling us that. In Luke 3, 16, John, the, John is making an announcement again. He responded to them saying, As for me, I baptize you with water, but he is coming. He who is coming is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the straps of his sandals. Here it is. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's John announcing the baptism of fire. So when you're dealing with the doctrine of the baptism of fire, someone might, might say, well, who's the first person to announce that? Well, we look at the scripture and we tell you that that's who it is. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire demonstrate the power of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> they demonstrate his power. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize with fire. Why? The omnipotent Jesus Christ is capable of doing that. In the days of Noah, now watch this. In the days of Noah, all unbelievers, how were they removed from the earth? Water. By water. 
See, God's, God's getting ready to do a new civilization. Age of the Gentiles. Get rid of all these people. They're unbelievers. They're, they're messing up here. Let's get rid of them. So he, he, he gets rid of all unbelievers from the planet by water. But how's he going to do it the second advent? He's going to do it by fire. So there's an analogy to the baptism of fire that's found in Matthew 24, 36 through 41. So it's, well, is there, is there any way, is this, is this taught in any other way? Are there any analogies? Well, certainly, Matthew 24. So let's look at this. And Troy, Troy, this, this passage is going to help you to understand and get the answer to the question you asked me about the notes. Did I predict the, the, the day that he's, of his return? <laughs> Troy, Troy was teasing me before class, and he wanted to know if I predicted the the time of he's coming in. So here's, a, here's what he says. He says, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, nor the, but the Father alone. Now listen, please, listen to this, please. Listen. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. Who's the Son? Jesus. Wait a minute. He's omniscient, isn't he? Why didn't he know? Why didn't he know? It's basically because he's talking about the humanity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus didn't know. He said, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just now watch this. For the Son for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For the coming of the Son of Man, just like the days of Noah, for as in those days, or Noah, in those days before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now watch this. Please look at what's going on today. Millions of people. What are they doing? Man, let, let me tell you what. It's a uh, we're ha well, hey, let's get together and have a meal. You see, these are these are normal things that are happening every day. And so during the days of Noah, God's getting getting ready to to wipe them all out, and they don't have a clue about what's going on. They know that they, they, they should have been living for Christ, but they're not living living the plan of God for their lives during that period of time. So the, hey, it's hip-hop there, enjoyment here, a pet over here, and, and then all of a sudden, bingo! It says here, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage as just normal things every day until the day of Noah that Noah entered the ark. Watch this. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Listen, that's a great analogy today. You go out here and you tell people how bad this is. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Well, let's see. Let's go down to Sonic and have a drink. Let's go down over here. We need to go out and have a party. Go to, oh, yeah, having a great time. Ah, oh, boy, I've got this $5,000 wedding coming up. Maybe $30,000 wedding coming up. I'm getting ready to do this, do that, do something else. Hold it just a second. Don't have a clue. Until. Until. Now watch this. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So he didn't have a clue about what life was all about. So, now watch this. He said, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So before I come back, it's going to be party time. They're doing this, doing that, doing something else. Don't have a clue when he's coming back. You go out and tell somebody now the rapture is the rapture's near. If it may be near, you say it that way. And they look at it and say, that's okay, let's go fishing. Let's do something else. Okay, that's fine. So then it goes on and said in, the, in verse 39, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be the same thing, just the same thing back then. Do you see some of that right now? He said, "At that time, now watch. At that time, when he comes back, this is the sec this is the uh, this second coming now. 
At that time, there will be two men in the field. This is the analogy. There will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Question. Two men. One's a believer and one's an unbeliever. Which one was taken? Believer. What? Believer. Which one was taken? Believer. You're going to take one and leave one. Believer. If you take if, at, at the second coming, if you if you leave one, where where is he going? If you if you take one, where is he going? Where is she going? See, so got it right. Where? Which one's the unbeliever? The one taken or the one left left here? One of them's going to hell. The other's going into the millennium. Which one is the so? Which one is taken? The believer, the unbeliever. The unbeliever. The unbeliever is taken. He's taken off the earth, and the believer is left on earth to go into the millennium. That's the idea. So the one taken. Is, going, is the unbeliever going into hell, taken off the earth, taken off the farm. Now, watch this. Now there are two women. Two women will be grinding in the mill. One will be taken, and one will be left. Which one grinding at the mill is going to hell? The one taken or the one left? That's right. The one taken will be going going to hell. It's an unbeliever. But the one on the left is going to be going to be remaining. Okay, now, in verse 40, the one left in the field is the mature, is the mature believer. And I say mature believer, it's it's someone who's functioning in the sphere of the spirit and doing doing what God wants them to do. Certainly it will be the believer, but I believe that others will be able to go also. You don't have to be mature. You just need to be Positive, you need to be in the sphere of the spirit, advancing spiritually. One taken by baptism of fire is the unbeliever. The one left in the field is the mature believer. The one taken by the baptism of fire is the unbeliever. Now, here's the analogy. The second advent is compared to the days of Noah. The second advent is compared to the days of Noah. When the people had no time for doctrine... Because they were too distracted by the pleasures of normal living. That's what's happening today. During the Noahic flood, unbelievers were removed from the earth by water. At the second advent, unbelievers will be removed by fire, the baptism of fire. Now what we have in number, point number eight is the parables of the baptism of fire. So someone might ask, it, well, are there any parables? Well, yes. How about the parable of the wheat, uh, the wheat and the weeds? Depending on what version of the Bible you're reading now, it, it, the, the terminology will be a little different. The wheat and the weeds here, the New American Standard. Wheat and the tares somewhere else. So this, the tares and the, and the, the chaff, the weeds, they're all, they're all similar. They're relating to the unbeliever. So in, in verse 13, 30 of verse 13, uh, chapter 13, he says, First gather the weeds... Parable of weeds and tares. Wheat and the weeds. First gather the weeds. These are unbelievers in the tribulation. And bind them in bundles to burn them. That's the baptism of fire. But gather the wheat, believers in the tribulation, into my barn. That's the millennium. Preserving them. In verse 37, he said, The one who sows the good seed, believers in the tribulation, is the son of man. Jesus Christ. He's sowing good seed. Those are believers. And the field is the world. He said, as for the good seed, believers in the tribulation, these are the sons of the kingdom. They're going into the kingdom. They're believers. And the weeds, unbelievers in the tribulation, are the sons of the evil one. That's Satan. And the evil one who sowed them is the devil. Sowing the unbelievers. And the harvest is the end of the age, the age of Israel. And the reapers are the angels. So just as the weeds, analogy is real weeds, just as real weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. 
Unbelievers at the end of the tribulation will go into the hellfire by way of the baptism of fire. There's also another, uh, other uh, parables. The parable of the good fish and the bad fish. The good fish are the who? Believers or unbelievers? The good fish are the believers and the bad fish are the unbelievers. Then there's the, uh, then there's the parable of the ten virgins. Five foolish virgins and five wise virgins. The, sh uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats. The sheep are the believers and the goats are the unbelievers. Then there was the talent test. Matthew 4, 25. The one talent man represents the unbeliever. The multi-talent man is the believer. So there are several parables that teach this very thing. Now it's right now it's 1108 and I, 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 I wrote these the verses in there for you. You could read those later, but I knew there was not going to be enough time to, to, to review all those. But remember, these are the, the parables that teach the baptism of fire. Then there is actually the Gentile baptism of fire. And that's Matthew 25, 31 through 46. That's, that, that's a, good, uh, a good passage to read when you have some time to, to do that. That's the Gentile baptism of fire. So they're looking at the Gentiles during the tribulation and telling you what these Gentiles, what's going to happen to them. Of course, the issue is the baptism of fire. They're unbelievers. And the believers will go into the millennium. And point number 10, the baptism of fire vindicates the character of Jesus Christ. This might take just a little more than just reading it to understanding, to get the idea here. The baptism of fire, thats you know what that is. The unbelievers are being cast into hellfire, Jews and Gentiles in the tribulation. And what the scripture is telling us in Revelation 19, 11, we get the idea here is that the baptism of fire is going to vindicate the character. Who is this guy? Jesus Christ. Look at the passage. John says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on, the, uh, sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. Vindicating. The baptism of fire is going to vindicate Jesus Christ. Who is this guy? Well, here he is. He's coming on a white horse. And the idea at that point in time, the, the king is on the white horse. The guy that's the ruler the guy that has the authority. So after all these years, someone say, oh no, he isn't who he is. He isn't. No, hang on just a second. At the second advent, when he comes back, he's coming on a white horse. That he's going to show you who he is. He's going to wage war against the unbeliever. Justice is going to prevail. This vindicates who he is. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, resurrected. Seated at the right hand of God the Father. You are seated in him right now. You have won the strategic victory. He's carrying it out now down here on planet Earth. Jesus is vindicated. How about uh, point number 11? The baptism of fire is necessary for the beginning of a new civilization in the millennium. See, the, new, the millennium begins with a brand new civilization. God has done this on, well, has done and will do this four times in human history, the angelic conflict. Gets so sick and tired of the way man is acting and working, just gets rid of all the unbelievers on four different occasions. Look at this. The four civilizations, the antediluvian civilization. That was the civilization before the flood. God purged that one by water. Then there's the post-diluvian civilization. That's the one we're in right now. This one will be purged at the. Uh, this one will be purged at the at the second advent. Then there's the millennial millennial um, civilization. Each one of these beginning with only believers, starting all over again. And at the end of the millennium, I'm going to purge it again. And it'll be all believers in the millennium, or in, in eternity future, and never have to have it, never have to do it again. 
So we're out of time. It's 11, 11 12, 13. So it's just time, time to pray at this point in time. And uh, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, Steve, go ahead and pray for us. And um, come on over here where we can hear you, okay? okay. Can, you, can you get over? So. By the way, Steve is, Steve is getting around pretty well now after having a total hip replacement about uh, how many months ago? A month ago. <laughs> okay. So go ahead and pray for us, buddy. Father, we thank you for this word that was brought today. <clears throat> it hit a home run. Thank you for this ministry and Dr. Jim's passion for teaching. For this is what will give America and the world the continuous, the remnant the, of yeah. born again believers being saved today in all over yeah. this country. And though born again believers who are maturing and growing in the grace and the knowledge of your word, like we did here today, yes. will be a part of the solution rather than the problem of resolving the angelic conflict. Mm -hmm. We realize that. So thank you so much for this awesome message this morning. We pray for the ripple effects of it to go out in the kingdom's work. And we ask you to bless the food we're about to partake in to give us better strength and energy to serve you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 By the way, Steve, as the uh, the uh, went are the, the the race is on again. You know, we had our first service at the track last Sunday, mm -hmm. and uh, it's every other week. So okay, had pretty good attendance. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, off and running. I got to see if I can walk on the track. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to close this out, folks.